welcome to this evening, which is looking rather flowery and somewhat <laughs> overdone uh, to the usual art matters session, which are more austere and elegant, I thought. But this is what we got from the IIC, yes. so we are keeping it like that. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, this is perhaps for the first time, or more or less for the first time, that Art Matters deals with another country's art. We usually have been occupied with ourselves. Um, but since uh, Erin Gleason was coming here and we got the news, so we thought we should rope in and know something about uh, the our own Asian uh, linkages and roots which existed and we seem to have been rather weakened during the so-called modern times. Uh, we seldom hear what's happening or see what is happening in Asia, even Southeast Asia. You know, something about China and something about Japan, very little about Cambodia or and I'm reminded of an episode. I, my, my first visit abroad, I was in France and we were staying in Rue de Rivoli in a hotel called Hotel de Brighton. And the reason why I was made to stay there by the French government, who's, who was my host, was that it had English speaking staff. Otherwise, um, they, you know, the French are very stubbornly French. So one day there was a Cambodian couple in the lift which I took to go down, and they were coming down. And seeing me, this uh, person said, uh, something I am swasti. So I couldn't get it, what did he say? What he was saying was, Siam swasti, which is wonderful Sanskrit for good evening. Oh. <laughs> and this is what he later told me. So I said, sir, what did you say? I didn't get you. He said, no, I said, I am Swasti. Then he told me that in, I don't know whether this exists anymore or not. And then he said, in the morning we say Prata Swasti. Oh. <laughs> so this was way back in 75 that I learned that in some parts of Asia, there's more India than in <laughs> India, perhaps, <laughs> at least in these kinds of uh, conversation. Uh, Erin Gleason is a curator, researcher, and writer based between Phnom Penh and Minneapolis. She is the curator of Akka. There is an exhibition which is opening tomorrow, Out of Line, which is what is indicated there. And uh, as far as I remember, this will be the first ever exhibition of Cambodian yes. artists, at least in Delhi, yeah. unless something had happened in Calcutta without our knowing. No. <laughs> Calcutta, a lot many things keep on happening without anybody knowing. Uh, uh, the, she is going to have uh, to consider a continuum of abstraction in the practice of ten artists from Cambodia. In fact, Cambodia itself is not a Indian word. The Indian word was Kamboj, uh, which perhaps was also taken by the French at one time. So the French used to call it not Cambodia, but Cambodge, D-G-E. And this was because we called it Cambodge. Anyway, so, and she has been in, she just said this for several years, she has worked in Cambodia. Uh, and uh, she has done what seems to, sh to be of particular importance to us is that she has not only discovered these artists from Cambodia, but took them, uh, as it were, to the world. And now they are artists who are invited, Cambodian artists who are invited to biennials and um, residencies and such like. So this is uh, also an important aspect of her contribution towards the Cambodian art. Now, before we invite her, let, let, let me take the opportunity and why still some people are trickling in, so give them an opportunity to 
start hearing you um, and done with my bits of so there's an exhibition of seven young artists in Triveni opening day after at 12 curated by Meera Menjis Phantom Limb and uh, this is part of a series that we have launched in Laza Foundation of asking a curator and an artist separately to pick up artists of their choice and to hold a show. So this is fifth or sixth in the series. So you're most welcome. And since this is a small audience, I can also tell you that we will have also brunch. So just in case on Sunday you make it there. Uh, on 24th November, in our annual memorial lecture series, we have uh, a Daya Krishna Memorial Lecture in India Habitat Center on 28th November. Can we afford? Can we afford not to be secular? By Professor Rajiv Bhargav. And uh, on 29th, 30th of November, we have another festival of young musicians and dancers, uh, young disciples of eminent gurus uh, in Dhrupad, Sarod, Odissi and Bharatnatyam in the main hall here uh, on 29th, 30th called Uttaradhikar. Uh, the next uh, art matters would be dealing, in fact two things are happening. On the 18th we have Gandhi matters in which Sumati Ramakrishnan is going to talk about the art of disobedience which is Gandhi and art and then on 20th we have three persons uh, Akil Birgami, uh, Abhay Dang and Sudipto Kaviraj talking again on Gandhi and the Arts, taking the cue from Devi Prasad's work with Gandhiji. So you're most welcome. And now, madam, may I invite you? And to say all the flowers and the floor <laughs> is yours. Thank you. 20th or 21st, right? Huh? She wants to do 20th Thanks. Um, thanks to the lands here, all the beings here at that IIC. I've had a, just a wonderful stay here. Um, and uh, to the Raza Foundation, to Akar Prakar for partnering to host me, um, to Rina, who I met a year ago, and I'll get back to that, for the invitation to curate the exhibition from which this talk is coming. Um, I'm speaking this evening, and for, um, oh, excuse me, and for, I, I don't want to forget Anjana and Ankush. Uh, and the whole team at Akar, who has been taking great care of the exhibition and the works um, and the installations. So I'm very grateful to all of your work. Um, I'd like to begin by sharing about a focused part of my relationship with Cambodia, which is um, working with artists. Of course, that's only one part of life, but it became a very big part of my life then. Um, and then I'll share how, um, how an exhibition of contemporary Cambodian art has ended up here in Delhi, in India, in this context. You spoke about some things that I will definitely return to, um, so that was very nice. Um, and then I want to move to speak about the artwork itself, um, and that an exhibition as a living form, what it can do uh, to kind of complement and counter what art history can do. Or can do. Just a little bit of that too. Um, so just a bit of personal introduction because I am not originally from Cambodia so that kind of sometimes occupies uh, some people's thoughts as I keep talking. So I just introduced that I'm from Minneapolis. It's in the Midwest of the US. Um, I studied art and art history. I worked um, when I was much younger in Minneapolis's museums and galleries before I had a grant to go to Cambodia from the University of Minnesota Human Rights um, department. So I was interested in working on borders or in post-conflict uh, nations or, or spaces um, and uh, questioning very idealistically what art can do or what art does in such spaces. 
So I chose Cambodia to go to. It was supposed to be much shorter than 17 years. It was only one year. <laughs> uh, many things happened. So um, I went to research create, uh, creative methodologies in human rights education. Um, and then I also, at the same time, was uh, researching the photographic archive from Tuls Lang. So if any of you have been there and will see some images in some artist works, um, it's a very large archive um, from a torture and prison center, um, which is just one of many, but this one is centralized and became quite a tourist destination as well. Um, so I was looking at how this archive had been um, appropriated into many different ways and forms that I found that other archives uh, from so-called post-genocide um, experiences had not been. So I was kind of doing these two pieces of research. Um, I started to teach at uh, the first private university, um, which has now become like such a huge university, but we're in one small building. Um, so it's a liberal arts program. Um, by 2005, 2006, was curating some exhibitions. Um, you know, dreaming with Cambodian artists of the Biennale of Cambodia and um, kind of reviving some of um, older artist practices that you'll see while while um, working with really, really emerging artists. So that was happening around that time. And then, um, I think I can move this. Um, and then I was, I, I was able to do kind of a volunteer internship with Rayum Institute of Art and Culture, um, which I will also come back to. And this led me to um, doing some of my own projects. Um, excuse me. <coughs> this one I still need for one page. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So I founded something called Basak Art Projects. And Basak Art Projects is a continuation of what I would do because um, at that time there was not necessarily this what we take for granted here, maybe, or what we take what we take for granted where I'm from is that we have galleries, we have uh, curatorial support, we have uh, printing, we have catalogs, we have documentation. These things were not present. Um, so without a space, you know, what can you, uh, what can you do? So a curator was not necessarily a word being used either, so I made this little brand, Basak, Basak Art Projects, to kind of hide behind, like I look like an NGO, because it's uh, very much populated the landscape of um, development work, aid work, healing work, um, so everything must be kind of categorized inside of this to be validated in a way. It's not like the arts or the contemporaries have much support at all from, of course, not the government, but also not the international community who has been coming in to save and resave and resave Cambodia for so long. Um, so called. So this is a, a project with Sfai Ken, uh, made his final exhibition before he passed away in 2008. Um, at a new art center called Bopana, which focuses on um, audiovisual archives. So I directed a film with him and uh, exhibition and a catalog. So that's kind of the work in 2007-8. And then um, uh, Sasa Art Projects is a collective, Sasa, and they are still very active. I encourage you to look further at their work. Um, not only are they doing these workshops, performances, giving residencies, but also um, making exhibitions. So they are the Sasa of what became um, Sasa Basak. So my Basak art projects and their programs, we came together to kind of make this formal space, like a contemporary art center, but a very small and small team. So um, I think we can move from this. Yes. So what we wanted to do was uh, do what, um, you know, any art center is doing, or even many uh, commercial galleries, is to excuse me, um, is to make this white space. Um, you know, give give space and uh, room for art to breathe. We had a reading center. We had a very active public program to complement each exhibition. Um, and so here are just some examples of of works. We'll see more of Danny's work. Uh, we'll see more of Spicer Red's work. But just some examples of. Um, works that happened in our space, sometimes a lot of video, um, a lot of taking over um, the gallery with things normally not in, uh, definitely not in commercial galleries, so filling the gallery with sand, um, performances, yeah, a lot of video. 
And then what we also did, which was already mentioned, is we uh, facilitated um, or produced works with other uh, partners. So this is Bangkok Art and Cultural Center, this is the Museum of Contemporary at Santa Barbara, this is the University of Wyoming, um, this is an art fair, we did some art fairs in Paris and Singapore, where um, they would give us space as a nonprofit because they were very curious about what are we doing. And in fact, we really depended on museum sales um, to keep us going because even as a nonprofit, there's no funding for what we did. So uh, Australia, especially Singapore, um, sometimes the Guggenheim, sometimes collections uh, in France, etc., did um, collect works, a lot of works from our exhibitions, and thankfully because it kept us alive. So. Um, some examples of our public programs and opening, um, symposiums, um, a lot of programs with children. Um, and sometimes we would take three months to kind of test a non-exhibition. So up on the upper right side, you see the Van Malibon project, a very prominent modernist architect, um, and his protégés who he has passed on his protégés who um, are trying to archive his work. So a lot of the archives, a lot of artworks have been destroyed through before, during, and after the Khmer Rouge. So it's not only that um, destruction, but also neglect, uh, loss um, of people studying in different places, etc. So there's this amazing project called the Ven Malibam Project. So we hosted this ar uh, archival architecture project. So yeah, it was very expensive work. Um, so in the last couple of years, um, I became very interested to work uh, with Southeast Asia, not, not only Cambodia, because what I found is these exchanges with our residency programs gave so much opportunity to the artists, right? So it kind of really speaks to what you were saying, is um, I was interested to not necessarily work on national terms anymore, and especially someone not coming from that nation. Um, because no matter how expensive artworks can be, no matter how much they take us to other places, um, as a director, you represent. And so, you know, constantly, um, you know, in a promotional mode. And as a curator um, and writer, I was really interested to find a bit of space from that. Um, and so, uh, the last couple of years, we had wonderful exchanges and exhibitions with Southeast Asian artists um, and kind of the hyphenated relationships with. Taiwan and China and, and other countries as well in the region. Um, and then, um, let's see. Yes, yeah, so we, we closed. <laughs> we closed in 2018, only a year ago. And we closed because the founders, co-founders and I, so I directed and we had different teams, wonderful small teams. Um, but we decided to kind of take different paths because I was very interested to continue working um, regionally, continue doing um, less nationalistic work, however important that is, um, because it still is so important to focus then on the next generation. If we can say five years are a generation, somehow it is in a context in which like 90% of artists had been murdered only 30, 40 years ago. So where are the artists coming from? It's very important we keep kind of putting that first solo exhibition and keep moving and moving and building relations. But maybe that work is also for that co-founding team and they have picked up this work. So actually since we closed, so many wonderful things have happened actually because maybe our closure also. So our former community projects manager has taken over a library and programs. Our former gallery manager has opened a cafe and gallery with other artists. There's a very professional gallery opened in Siem Reap the year we closed, which I talked with them through to opening. Um, in our former space is a graffiti gallery. Uh, all of these things are new in one year. And I think somehow it also stirred, you know, when something closes, it stirs so much emotion. And, um, and then you need to say, um, what do we do? And so many people did so many things. So the legacies, of course, live on with all these artists, as you were saying, you know, they are moving and other people are doing these programs. So that list is very long of what's going on. I want to shift a bit now to talk about um, not only what you know, I was doing in Cambodia, but um, why contemporary art? 
um, from Cambodia is in Delhi, is in India. And I did look, uh, you know, has there been a contemporary art exhibition in India, in Delhi? I tried, I did, I looked, I looked, I couldn't find anything. There are for sure been um, these hyphenated diplomatic exchanges in Do Cambodia. A number of our artists have come for residencies in Darjeeling and different places, but maybe there hasn't been this a modern or national show. For sure there's been travel, there's been making together, <coughs> but I'm not sure. I won't claim it, but I'm not sure. Um, but what we do see is something like this. So art in Cambodia, interactions with India. Um, as a student, as a graduate of SOAS, you know, we, we must read about these histories of India, how they've influenced Cambodia, and whether or not there is an Indianization of Cambodia, and how, and how to counter that and say maybe uh, not so much, not as much, how so. And this ongoing um, scholarly and our art historical dialogue um, that is kind of never ending because we are always inventing new uh, research and technologies and stories and thinking around what these ancient relics have meant across time. So I think this is the kind of space in which we know that exchange between Cambodia and India most. Um, so this ex exhibition is not, um, you know, not only to update this, not really thinking so much in that way, um, but is more so, I'll leave this on the screen. This is my second time in India, I'll just give you how this came about. It was last year when I was speaking at the Experimenta Curators Hub in Kolkata, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. It's wonderful, you should go. And Rina is there. And um, she came to me after my talk and um, we just had a nice exchange. And again, as I said, we were thinking of something Southeast Asia and perhaps this is something we keep speaking about. But after her trip to Cambodia, um, you know, it came back to let's do something, you know, focused um, to really learn about what is really happening in that context. And so I thought, wow, I just came out of trying to step away from this national framework. What do I do? <laughs> um, I, d I needed a breather. And in fact, it was a, a really a gift of an invitation because with a year um, away from the context, I was able to um, really think about this exhibition, I guess, um, beyond its nationalism. Um, and I have this slide here because when we think about national exhibitions, we should never, I think, I, I can never forget that they are a colonial um, construction. So we started exhibiting, um, you know, in these uh, colonial frameworks, uh, regions like Indochine, that is just a geopolitical region for a certain moment. And now we, we need Southeast Asia. It is a geopolitical region, just like a nation. So I'm never, um, I'm, I'm not ever unaware of this. A triple negative way of saying I'm very aware of that when I think about making exhibitions um, because of what I want to put forward is something that's not going to be inclusive of a nation that's not going to be easy um, you know that's just going to give you um, relationships with each artwork and maybe a light line if I can use out of line to follow but not something of a heavy framework so uh, we pursued this um, Oh, I have something more to say about that. So, um, I had a nice conversation uh, before coming in. I'm not sure of your name, but um, it was about, you know, has there been modern, modern art before contemporary art in Cambodia? Uh, some of the former Indochine nations uh, have a different timeline, maybe. And so I just wanted to speak to uh, my advisor, my professor, Ashley Thompson, that, um, you know, just a few scholars who are looking, and not just me, definitely, so many, so many others, but Ashley Thompson is looking at uh, the ethnographic in the contemporary, and perhaps how the ethnographic was the modern. Um, and thinking about time like this, Roger Nelson is also trying to mess with, a, you know, chronology, and so he'll always list, he founded uh, with other colleagues, Southeast of Now. It is a very nice journal if you like to um, learn more about Southeast Asian art, modern and contemporary. So it's um, Southeast, Asia, uh, Southeast of now, modern, uh, contemporary and modern art. So it's kind of always trying to play in Southeast Asia, when was the modern and when was the contemporary and do they overlap? Um, it's actually a very fruitful um, conversation um, that doesn't at all follow 
uh, the Western uh, timelines, even the Eastern timelines, or even the neighbor neighborly timelines. You know, every every um, you know place has all its own, and so that's very important for me in this exhibition and really through my work. Um, so. Um, these are some of the references. Um, many of them are published by Ram Institute of Art and Culture, uh, which was open from 1999 to 2009. Cultures of Independence. Um, on the right, it's in Khmer, temple painting. Uh, these start to show us uh, what modernism looked like. And that perhaps, um, this is 1961, the first film festival, which um, Former King Sejong gave himself first prize <laughs> as a filmmaker. Uh, on the left is Lee Bun Yim's Khmer's after Angkor, one of Cambodia's uh, most famous filmmakers. On the left is Nyak Dem, who is considered you know, the master, the modernist. Um, and then a USIS, United States Information Service um, catalog. It's actually just a price list inside a brochure of uh, a painting exhibition uh, over the course of three years. Um, that had thousands and thousands of, of young of people coming, of citizens coming. So there was definitely a movement. This might look like it's not in the 60s, um, and it might not look like it's in, this looks more like the 80s, actually. Um, but it, there's definitely a lot of movement, and there's nothing as if something proof there's contemporary art or proof there's some discovery. There's always been a continuity, and I think it's also really important to to remember that, and even to go back to like the 20s and the 30s, did modern art happen in the temple, um, on the temple walls? And I definitely believe so. So here you have Angkor Wat, it has a, this is from Ashley Thompson's research, um, it has a clock in the center of Angkor Wat, it has a, a French uh, light post, um, it has tiling on the walls as if it's the 50s, um, so you have this conflation of time, and this is in, in 39 on a temple in what is now Vietnam, but formerly Kampuchea Krom. So um, modernism, just trying to say, has, has happened in different ways in different times in Cambodia. So coming to the exhibition, basically I'm going to like give you a walkthrough. There are no images of the exhibition as we open tomorrow night um, yet. And so I'm just going to talk through the three uh, kind of ideas and three rooms um, and the artists and in the talking through maybe I go on tangents of, a little bit about about different artists so um, yes this exhibition considers this continuum continuum of abstraction and I would like to say also that um, I really thought about Rina and Abhishek and your family and your history and your collection and what Akhar working with Akar Parkar is working with with modernists, but not only, right? So this is the roots, but not only. Um, and I thought, oh, maybe it's a nice time or a nice place to be able to have the um, sympathies of modernism, uh, you know, in connection to where, what has come from there in Cambodia, because we don't necessarily have those neat sympathies, as, as I just told you. So can we use this kind of tenant of the line and of abstraction? We don't use that word so much in Cambodian. Abstract, it doesn't translate. And if you do translate it, try to find the words, it, it's um, something that is not clear. It's not clear, we can't see it clearly. We can't understand it clearly. And, um, and this has been you know, challenging. The artists have um, very much had a challenge to make all of these works. They might look familiar to you or as if they have occurred elsewhere, but many challenges in making something that is very much abstract in the Cambodian context, maybe not so much elsewhere. So I thought, yeah, Akar Pakar is a nice place to start or you know, continue that conversation. Um, so we're looking at artists born between 1933 and 1990. Um, making conversation between the deviant and fecund potentials of this title out of line. Out of line, of course, signals somebody out of place, something out of place, something that should be back in place, something that's deviant. Um, but it can also signal what line can give birth to. Out of line what? 
out of line what can come. Dominant art historical narratives have plotted lines, behavior, and function through time as a continuum. So language, ritual, um, decoration, narrative towards its status as a formal element of art treated within modernism's value system. We analyze the line um, in modernism to a conceptual and critical tool of the contemporary. So this exhibition is proposing like all of these meanings of line and abstraction at the same time when we consider contemporary art in Cambodia. And as I said, the exhibition is divided into three sections. It's drawing attention to how artists have construed their personal desire for new relationships, both the freedom from and a dialogue with nationalized identities and aesthetics um, through figural, partial, or total abstraction. So as I said, these might not look like works of resistance or that they're holding tension with any kind of validated, nationalized aesthetic, but they very much are. So we start with Sfai Ken. Um, he's in a room of four artists, and these have four generations bring together um, paintings and sculpture and drawing who are kind of enacting this etymological root of, of, of abstract, which means to draw away. Um, so Sfai Ken has really drawn away from what was accepted um, in his generation uh, at the art school. So he is self-taught. He, I, I use this as one of my favorite paintings of his, but he worked for 35 years as a cleaner, as a concierge at Raffles Hotel in Phnom Penh. Changed many owners, but you know, it ended up as Raffles again. Um, and then he started to paint um, tourists and their objects, their motorbikes, their huts, the pool, and started to sell these to, to the tourists and started to earn more than his salary and was looking for a, a way to retire. He started painting when he was 60. He passed away when he was 76. So he had a very autobiographical practice. Um, sometimes I think this is him in all those different poses. Um, and sometimes I think it's a group, you know, you don't, he's not with us anymore to, to think about each work. Um, so I have this image to show you um, what he, where he did not come from. This is a national museum in the Royal University of Fine Arts. They were built at the same time, um, and they were very much interconnected. They still are today. Very much looks like this today. Um, it was a really a company. So French built an established company to bring in the workshops, which were the royal workshops. So silversmithing, uh, weaving, silk weaving, cotton weaving, mask ma lacquer mask making, um, and then they introduced painting in 52 as well um, to be modern. And this was through a Japanese, French trained Japanese painter called Suzuki. So it was really kind of extending the palace's workshops, um, saying that you don't have to be from Preveng Takao to be a master where those things thrive. You can be trained right in the city. And then these can be objects, and then we can sell them in Paris, and we can sell them in our museum shop. So this lasted, uh, you know, for many generations, and of course there's been incarnations with different regimes, um, but to this day the Fine Arts School and the National Museum are still very much interconnected. Um, the Art School itself will be moving, unfortunately. Um, we don't know what's going to happen to the school itself and the land. But um, there was, when I left, one student enrolling in the Modern Painting and Sculpture Program. Um, it's a very young country. Um, of 15 million people, there are probably, you know, nine million of them who are young and deciding, you know, at least two million every year, what are they going to be? And that one student decides to be a national, in the National Art School, to be a painter, one, to enter the program. So it feels to us who care that it's a crisis and where will the artists come from? So I think it's really relevant to tell that story when we think about Sfai Ken, because Sfai Ken did not choose this way. And because he did not choose this way, in fact, he became the artist that is defining this kind of marker and influence and confluence between the modern and the contemporary. <laughs> and that happened because um, the Fukuoka Asian Art Museum made a triennial in the late 90s, 97. And they came to do research, a very inclusive of any practice. If you look at the inclusion of Laos or other re you know, regional countries, you might see, um, you know, what looked like a, a, 
uh, style or you know it's not like they're looking for something too cool they're very inclusive but and this trip with the facilitation of Rayum um, they looked at very traditional practices which is really what you could find you could also find I'm just going to skip and then go back you could find work like this which I'll go back to that history a lot of work like this and like this um, but they chose work like this so they chose Fai Ken over all of these national artists and there was a lot of tension because of that, you know, but he became the first, uh, you know, the contemporary artist to be in the triennial and then, of course, to be collected by Fukuoka and he's in the collection of, um, around the region, most collections. Um, so he championed, uh, you know, the everyday, the laborer, um, not necessarily in a romantic way, but trying to humanize his own experience of seven regimes over 76 years. So even it's the moment of living through the Khmer Rouge. Um, this is the manda it's not a very good slide, sorry. Mandatory meeting every day they had to come and listen um, to um, the propaganda and participate in the propaganda. But you don't see much blood in this painting. Sometimes you see the morning meal. It might be some pieces of rice, but it's still every day. There's something consistent about him painting. What is the everyday, no matter what regime you live under? Um, yeah, so this countered completely the kind of romance. Um, and also the other way of, you know, some artists do show um, grief and blood and black and white and red and trauma. Um, it's not that he doesn't, but he consistently, he doesn't change his palette, let's say. So Svaiken, yes, is in, in the exhibition. This is kind of anchor. Um, and the, he's, uh, Pichantan is not in our exhibition, but I wanted to give him relation to Sosudavi. Um, we have a row of very rare uh, figure drawing sketches for a painting such as this from Sosudavi that have never been shown. And the same with Svaiken's work. These two works have never been shown before. Um, and these are relics, these drawings from Soso de Vie are really relics from a program of a post-Khmer Rouge uh, time. Khmer Rouge is 1975 to 1979. And uh, the Vietnamese uh, government, led by the current um, prime minister, um, you know, some people say liberated and other people say invaded. Regardless, in 79, the Khmer Rouge uh, was toppled. But this government uh, continued to rule from 1799 to 1991. So it was during this time where uh, the Minister of Culture uh, realized that through a census that there were 90% uh, of artists who had died. So how do you rehabilitate the arts and culture? How do you rehabilitate a society when you have 10% of masters or students left? So the government had implemented a program to send cohorts of students, high achievers in uh, all fields to uh, Soviet-friendly um, countries, Vietnamese-friendly countries, which are Soviet-friendly countries at that time. So uh, Pi Chan Tan and um, Su Su Davi and many others went to Poland. These two went to Hungary, some Ukraine, some former Soviet Union, some Congo, Cuba, etc. Vietnam, East Germany. Um, many came back, some didn't come back. Um, and we don't have, you know, a lot of traces of that work when they were away. So it's like a gap um, in art history in a way, and a gap in kind of exhibition histories. We just went to the museum, Gerenada museum. museum, and I was just thinking like, wow, if, I don't know if we only had, you know, so many traces of like consistency of being able to go deeply into some of these artists' works, but it's very sparse because of those histories. Um, Yes, so even though, yes, the drawings or this, it might not be necessarily abstract. Um, the idea is that the tension here and the resistance here, even though it's this lovely, you know, a woman carrying a basket or... It's that for so many years he couldn't and nobody could draw or paint anything, really, except if you were employed to be a propagandist. Um, and so that you can draw these enlivening images, you know, of a dancer or a laborer that is not being oppressed or that can dance. You know, it seems very romantic, but it's it's 
it's very symbolic to have that freedom after such a regime. Um, this is Faisaret, is in the same room, so another <coughs> portrait or a figure study. Um, he learned drawing in a refugee camp program and then extended this with his colleagues to found a very important nonprofit, non governmental art school called Far Panusal back in the north of Cambodian Batambon. And then he studied in France for about a decade. Um, this, um, his practice employs futility and coded resistance, which is extremely palpable in this video. Uh, it's called Eyes Faisaret Eat Rubber Sandals. Staging an absurd meal at the site of an impoverished fishing village, the artist is chewing and spitting out the black rubber sandals that are highly symbolic of regional Cold War communism and its legacies. This is Nov Chinik. He was born in 1990. Sveisaret in 1972. Sosodevi in 1955. Sveiken in 1933. So this room in the gallery has three, four very different perspectives. Um, so. The young generation, like Chinik, and you'll see in the works of Kanita as well, they really reject perpetuating any kind of iconography associated with Cambodian. Very much do not want to be a part of this representing. Um, in his words, it's in fear of what he says, reducing the vision of culture. Chinik studied also at FAR in the Northern School and then also in France. And his paintings show an expressive search for freedom from representation. This is a work in the exhibition, Sitter. He's fully redacted the top of the, he, he, he first painted it and then redacted fully. Um, and now he's moved fully into all over abstraction, uh, thinking about meditation and medical, uh, sorry, metaphysical systems. So we move to another room. It has three artists. Um, and the gallery is routing abstraction through, in Cambodia, what we say, kvike, which might be like, it's, it's translated as design code. So Kvike is an ancient and evolving design code. It's drawn from nature, whose infinite versatility and pervasive application is granting cultural identity to all it adorns, objects, um, garments, architecture. Um, in this room, Tan Sok, this is not the work in the show, but to give you some um, background to his practice, he's always investigating spiritual and religious beliefs and materials, especially um, how they change over time. On the left is called the halo of the omnipresent eye, um, thinking about um, the alms bowls and as we give, what do we receive? Karmically, we're being watched. So he's very critical of religious practice. On the right is a, a reproduction and scaling up of a gambling game called Clock Clock. And he, he figures in different images like keys, roses, money, um, again, what does it mean when we gamble on giving to receive? So giving, you want something back. So he's thinking about this karmic um, reciprocity in the belief system. And the work um, here, um, this is from the same series, but not the work, is uh, Kabaitak, which means water forms. And it's really in reverence, but also a reinvention of the traditional water forms that we see in the temple paintings. So canonical representations in Hindu and Buddhist temple paintings in Cambodia always, many of them have water, deal with water. Hanuman is jumping over the world. Um, Lanka has a whirlpool of war. Um, so it's always this epic representations of water. But um, one of his professors, you know, encouraged them to reinvent Quebec and to think that we don't only need to perpetuate the same five forms. So he said, you know, what what is it like when I watch the spiritual confluence of the Chonesap and Mekong rivers. What happens there? What does that water look like? What does the pond in my village look like? What does the canal, still canal, what does it look like? Um, so he puts water at the forefront as like a living being, not only a secondary thing to a myth or to human control, but really animates water into these really meditative um, spaces. Back to Chandani. Um, <coughs> So they went to the same school, the Rayum School, the Rayum Art School, Tansok and Chandani. So you see definitely some resonance between how they play with these traditional forms. Um, he's re reinterpreting and very much playing with the forms. Um, his ongoing Sampot series, which is exhibited um, here, uh, is considering the traditional garment um, and how the kabak changes, the colors, the fibers, um, so the fine silks and the dyes and the loom weaving, of course, is now synthetic. Many, of, much of it is synthetic and printed, and um, you know, not even worn anymore. 
Um, so using industrial sheet plastic in this work, um, I'll go back, this is a detail of one of the works. Um, he's applying vinyl and mylar stickers and these kind of bling rhinestones you put on your phone um, to be very unwearable sampot, new sampots for his generation. So sampot is the skirt you can compare to the sari. Uh, you know, it, it has a lot of, is very imbued with meaning. Which one you wear, when you wear it, how old you are, if it's bright or not. Um, I, I told Rina, when I wear one that's too bright, they say, I'm, I'm too old, I shouldn't be wearing that. <laughs> if I wear one that's too dark, they say, you need to wear something brighter. <laughs> um, you know, or you shouldn't wear that because you're not, you know, Cham or Khmer or what ethnicity you are. It's, it says a lot. So yeah, now not many people wear them anymore. And so in fact, Danis, you can't wear. They're just plastic boards um, adorned like with bling. Uh, his previous work, just some examples, he, he's very interested in you know, using like unprecious materials. And um, so on the left, amazingly, oh, yeah. is from um, pencil shavings. So I don't have a detail, but this is a two meter door panel and it's made of pencil shavings. And then these kind of um, emblems on the right, these stars were an installation in another gallery. Um, so this is Sin Mani, another young artist in 1990. You'll see like Chinek completely not interested to say that there's any association here with something that could aesthetically or kind of graphically be Cambodian. So he's interested in signage um, and the line actually. The line is really his subject. Um, this was from his first exhibition. This is the work on the show. He's transforming discarded iron grating in windows that have different expressions of Quebec, whether they're geometric or more ornate. Um, and so he's welding, re-welding these pieces from scrap, scrap uh, yards and then doing uh, rubbings. And he says uh, in his words, he wants to preserve the blacksmith's designs, but give them a second life, creating another view and a potential escape to an imaginary other world. And the final gallery, we have five artists, but two we've already looked at. And this gallery is um, maybe a sense of rawness because it's really about uh, the, the use of materiality, the raw use of materials. Um, holding space on both sides of the gallery are two of Cambodia's leading female artists. This is Tit Kanita, and we'll look at Yemalin. Um, and then the other works in collage and assemblage uh, from three other artists which use really highly symbolic materials in very bold ways um, to challenge ideological power. So Kanita is born in 87. Um, she is completely born to resist authority, um, born to resist her role as a woman in her culture. Um, yeah, resistance in a good way. She acknowledges and believes that instinct and playing is a right and a discipline. And I think you can see that in her work. She asks, how can I make freedom physical? She hand coils, laboriously hand coils, uh, thin gauge um, steel wire and shapes it and lets it talk to her really until she says, until it can breathe on its own. This process is a kind of drawing with wire, she says, in her tactile means of tracing time. Uh, seeking relation both within and beyond her society, her sculptures are, in quote, she says, not made to be believed in or prayed to. Their spirits are abstract. So even though she is nonconformist, she's very, very aware that here at Sasabasak, we are down the street from the <coughs> National Museum. And she is very much honors those who came before her. But those previous, you know, we know Cambodia from its from its figurative uh, sculpture, stone statuary, and uh, they are meant to be prayed to. And so she's very much in dialogue with these forms, but completely resisting these forms as well. There you see some more detail. Can you please come to the exhibition. You can see her new work. Yemalin is born in 82. Um, she's responding to local and global climatic and cultural change. She uses materials also found um, as a way to kind of remember and honor this moment during the Civil War when that's all there was to play with. She also believes in play um, and instinct. They do have this in common very much so. Um, this is a series decomposition. Um, it started out on paper, very small works, and then she wanted more and more depth 
and it resulted in this series, which is in the gallery. Um, these pose as precious tree slices whose unlikely rings are out of sync with time, parasitic colonies attack and psychedelic growths huddle on their surface and she asks us what can grow from the complex deaths, the decompositions of today's environmental and cultural change. I found this one, this is for you, Crossing India and English Cultures. <laughs> so Saikon uh, is a storyteller, a very, very avid, um, talented and bold storyteller. Um, uh, he combines autobiography, myth, religion, politics, and popular culture. He's uh, collecting ephemera everywhere he goes. He'll go to demolition sites, schools, outside prisons, everywhere he travels in the world, ask his friends to gather things for him. And then he pulls this together. This is collage is part of his practice. It does end up on his canvases as well, but in very different ways. Um, so a lot of it is um, even more moralistic. And I have a, a, a short... Um, quote from him describing, he has a big stories for each one of these. Um, this is from uh, an a exhibition in Catalog um, we worked on, Manhattan and Body Unite. Um, he's using a leather, actually, like puppetry, uh, the tradition of leather puppetry, so there's a lot of um, weight and depth on this canvas. So, and you can see all the Wi-Fi's around the Hindu gods. <laughs> the Wi-Fi signals, which is how we communicate these days and pray. So here, this is in the exhibition, and I just want to read how he thinks and how he makes. So this is from him. According to my feeling memory, my first visit to Tulslang, his prison, was in 2002. I got sick when I went inside. I was sad and angry at the same time. I saw people, what the people had gone through there. I'm also angry when I look into the history. For this work, I want people to see, who see it to smile. People acknowledge anger and suffering, and there is a smile also. I feel the pain when I see the things at Tulsling. I've been doing many works about Tulsling. Over time, I started thinking to myself, we need to put wings and let them fly. It would be great to know that their spirits found any sense of freedom or peace. I imagine one person's life is now an exhibition to show the world, and let's not say, my suffering is now an exhibition, but let's say it's good for people to learn this history, but at the same time, let the person fly away when he wants to have a look around. That's why I gave him wings. He can see Phnom pen how much has everything changed. He can hear and see the music of culture before the Khmer Rouge. He can think of his family or go pay a visit to his mother's tomb in the pagoda. There's a connection in the past for him, and creating this work is trying to give him freedom, release him from his sufferings. This is Faisaret again. You can notice the, the chewing of the shoes. There's also a sculpture. It's called Steak or Skewer. The black rubber sandals are weighing on a noodle vendor's carrying pole. Um, and they mark the number of years that the artist was in labor and refugee camps, which is 17 years of his life. Um, Faisaret, the pole acts as a stake for the border makers and a skewer for those who step out of line. So in this case, the line is, in each case, the line is multiple meetings, in this case, border making. And finally, the final work in the exhibition is, uh, again, Tan Sok, who had the water work, um, and the monks' alms bowls. This is Sraibon. Um, Sraibon is made from Buddhist clerical garments, whose colors signify ranks within the two sects of Cambodia's Theravada Buddhist systems. Historically, this robe is rectilinear in form, and its seams are imitating the rice field. So even today, when we can weave uh, a large sheet, like a bed sheet, they still uh, are uh, adding um, the dikes uh, in the robe. Don't need them. You know, used to weave maybe by foot or a small loom, and so you had to piece together the robe. But in fact, um, it's made to be fertile, like, like the rice field. And the monk, or the man who puts on the robe, monk or not, is imbued with a merit field, um, which is why people continue to come and come close in that merit field and give an offering, um, a blessing, you know, you are blessed in the field of this robe. Um, so he's done, a, Soka's done a lot of thinking and critical thinking about what this robe um, really does, and does it really do what it says it does. Uh, and uh, so he has cut a hole, holes, 
um, out of these robes and hung them um, to show the, the mortal being, the mortal human, underneath the robe to remind us, um, to remind us of that. And, uh, and then hung them uniformly regardless of the rank and the color and the novice to the, to the master. Um, and uh, to, to question the hierarchical notions of sect and rank, which are somehow the moral core of society for many. Um, and then there's a view in the recent um, very large survey of Southeast Asian art, Sun Shower, at the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, with um, Monty and Boomna's work is in the front, a Thai, very Thai contemporary master. Um, so that's a preview of the exhibition without it showing you the, you know, actual, a lot of the actual work. Um, you know, just the short conclusion is, um, you know, I'm hoping the exhibition gives you, gives, gives a hospitable place for the works themselves. I really feel it does, I trust it does, and I'm so, um, so interested to hear uh, feedback from the team when I leave um, and share that with the artists. And then, um, yeah, also to acknowledge that, you know, the encounters with the work might not, um, yeah, just as a reminder, the encounters with the work may not show all the artists have strived for um, to kind of break really existing harsh aesthetic expectations, um, nationalized expectations of how they should act. Um, but they are all out of line. <laughs> um, yeah, so I hope there's a synergy here between the kind of, you know, the writing of art history that's just being done um, and all the missing pieces you can hear from the different histories and uh, what an exhibition can do to kind of, you know, have a conversation with the writing of art history. Thank you. So we open to questions. Uh, I'd just like to ask you something. You know, when we were uh, talking in the gallery, I said, uh, how do you know, how many artists are there in Cambodia who are really doing contemporary art? And uh, we had Suresh Ji here a while ago who said, oh, is there really contemporary art in Cambodia? And uh, so the same thing uh, I would like to... Can't say it with me. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, Erin actually said, well, I said, you know, in India, when you do an abstract, a show of abstraction, we, could, we have hundreds of artists to choose from. And uh, she said uh, something strange. She said, oh, well, there are very few artists. And <coughs> each of them who are now practicing are really the contemporary artists. So more or less, we have the whole contemporary art scene of Cambodia <laughs> here in Akar Prakar. So maybe you'd like to add to that. You know, I've been created, I don't know if this is on or not. I think it's on. on. It's Hello? Yes. I've been, I have been criticized by saying, oh, there's few, few contemporary artists. Um, it's because of that sensitivity to what is contemporary, you know, and what, what is that. There's not really validation systems. And so actually, when I think about how many professional practicing artists there are, let's just say they're all contemporary because they're working today and they're trying to achieve new languages. Doesn't matter if it's good, it's bad, whatever, this effort is there to try and participate. Um, and again, you know, good and bad, what, there's different validation systems. So these 10 artists are for sure the, you know, some of the, they are the leading artists. And there are others too. Um, but 10 is a lot for our one, <laughs> one space and effort. Um, but let's say maybe there are, I think, 50 artists in, in the country. Um, I usually use that number. But that means like the very emerging artists, maybe that's 10 of them, that are just having their first small grand, first solo show, um, or not even first work in a workshop, and then it goes into a cafe gallery. And then there are the masters who went to these uh, Soviet countries, and they're at the Royal University of Fine Arts, or um, you know some of them didn't come back. And maybe there's um, there was over 20 of them, but who kept practicing? Maybe 10. But how are they practicing? Mm, not so much. They're invited for an exhibition once every five or six years. Um, maybe Sunday painters. They're very busy. 
doing governmental responsibilities. And then there's like in between, which is, you know, the artists who are moving around to that you see in biennials and documenta and, you know, these large platforms. And this is maybe five. Um, and then there's, um, yeah, so we have, it's like two art schools, Batambang, the far art school, and then the National, uh, the Royal University of Fine Art, there's one national school. Um, the artists, yes, are, are coming from these schools, the Rain Institute of Art closed, and the two artists in this show are the ones who really continued as artists. Um, a lot of others are designers, architects, um, going into the practical arts, um, and that's what's happened at the Royal University of Fine Art as well, the practical arts have taken over. Um, and so like Sin Mani and all of the 10 or you know 30 artists trying to be artists right now, they're learning by workshops. So exchanges, you know, the U.S. brings something, France has a program, there's a photo festival, and there's the first workshop, there's the exchange with Vietnam, and there's workshops, and then, you know, someone comes out of this and tries the next workshop, and the next workshop, and if they keep, want to keep going, or they, you know, are given in the few spaces there are, and now there are more spaces, and then it goes like this. So, yeah, I can say, there are not, there are not many, and yes, these ten are, you know, some of the leading artists. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody has any more questions? If you can further elucidate, elaborate on the name Cambodge which is ascribed to Cambodia in ancient times. What is the real genesis or origin <coughs> of this name for Cambodia, for <laughs> Kambuj? Yes. Kambuja. I'm not, I'm not a Sanskritist, and uh, I am an art historian, but not that far back. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Uh, Cambodia has uh, you know, many names. Uh, Kambuja, Kamboj was the French name. Um, Kampuchea is uh, what a lot of Cambodians still call Cambodia, uh, but it was also used during the democratic rule of Kampuchea, which is the Khmer Rouge. Um, you know, East German Germans still call Kampuchea Kampuchea when I make exhibitions there. Um, so I'm not a, not a Sanskritist, um, but it was a beautiful introduction because, you know, and I, I love this fact about Cambodia, is you go back to the epigraphy, and again, I, I'm very, I am not schooled in these fields, but I, I revere some of the those who are, and I follow their work. And I really love um, the fact that a lot of these um, records, these monument stellas that are inscribed, um, the rubbings tell us that the, that Cambodia, I just say Cambodia, what what it was then, is a bilingual place. So you have two languages. Um, and then evolving languages, and then there's Cham, which is uh, the Islamic culture coming from the East Coast, from uh, Panduranga, and so it, it was a multi, um, not a uniform, you know, not only Indianized, and not only Khmer, Khmer, and not only, but there were multi-languages. Um, large Chinese presence from the 12th century. Um, so I, I can't speak to that. But I, I really, really appreciated that introduction. My, my colleagues at SOWIS are the Sanskritists. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Gleason, for that wonderful talk. Uh, your exhibition is great. It ties up the political, the aesthetic, the affective. Um, it, it looks like it's going to be some very fulsome uh, work that we'll see uh, hopefully tomorrow. Um, my question to you is more about curatorship, mm -hmm. and I mean this with the utmost respect. You are, after all, an American uh, woman who's representing this work in uh, other Asian countries. Well, how are there? How many curators are there in Cambodia, and why why don't we see them here, and why do we see you? Yes. A great question. So I think you will soon see them here. <laughs> so that's the idea. You know, if I 
were to stay and continue and continue, as I said, you know, I, I am in that represent, representative uh, mode, and that I can't escape it if I'm running a program, uh, running a space there. <coughs> and I, like I said also, I did not expect to, to do another national uh, exhibition, maybe ever, or until I was much older, um, because of that concern or that discomfort, yeah. So again, I think just it's this dialogue and this idea also that I wanted to be, I remember the moment, I wanted to be expensive, to not be nationalistic, and to be in dialogue with you know, many cultures for that benefit of um, our audiences in Cambodia and, uh, and outside. And when I thought about Rina, I thought, OK, she's asking me to do something maybe I don't feel like doing. But I can't forget that she's being expensive. You know, it's you asking to denationalize your program for a moment. You know, as a commercial gallery, this is like really bizarre. It's not about a profit. I mean, I'm sorry, but I don't really know about that. You know, so I thought um, for sure I can do that. I have a long and I mean really deep relationships over these last 17 years with this artist. So it's something that's possible, mm -hmm. and something the artists are happy to do. So I thought it's a, also a challenge for me to, and an opportunity to, this exhibition I, I can't really make, um, I don't know if I would have thought of it in this kind of uh, art historical, or there's a bit of distance there. It's not like what people know of Cambodia and what I've had to support also, because my role is to support, is a lot of, um, um, resistance narrative and this kind of like rewriting history and a lot of men saying that you know they can rewrite history and these action a lot of action based and and it just felt for me also a chance to be reflective with a bit of a distance yeah and it um yeah and regardless uh even if i'm not making these exhibitions i still uh, have I think still a responsibility, but also ongoing life work, writing, still supporting. And to come to where the Cambodian curators, um, those, uh, those that have worked with, with me and Sasa Basak are now curating. So the community projects, like I said, she, I mean, she's not only running the library space, but she's a curator. Mm -hmm. So she's taken, actually taken work, that uh, it's, it's becoming this time where it's not only you asking that, it's Cambodians who are now architects, who are running their own companies, who not necessarily collecting or whatever, but saying, where, where are, where is a Cambodian to do this? You know, and I think in many fields. And however healthy it is, it's still like, if you didn't know the history, it sounds really like xenophobic or, you know, right? But if you know the history, you know why it's important. Mm -hmm. Right, and so the way anybody's working, like uh, Pierre May, Roger, Nell, all these scholars, Ashley Thompson, we don't just work at a distance and you know say we really live together, work together, and by making exhibitions together, then the artist can work with another curator. By the curator, by this team we work with, they can do their own. So anybody that worked with us and SAS our pro SAS our project space. So now it's like people will continue to write to me, and I just can pass them to all these people, <laughs> you know, which was not the case. It's it's actually true. So it's not as if you know the word discovery is very uncomfortable. I don't think I really discovered anything. It's just you're there when something is happening. Yeah, and then again, it's putting a system in place. Is it relevant or not? It was like a test, not like let's put this system here. We didn't expect to last so long. We didn't expect that people, <laughs> you know, I, we just didn't expect. In the process, there's a lot of, I don't like the word capacity building. I really don't, but it really happened, you know. So, in fact, there's, sure, there's foreigners still working there in the arts, for sure, and they do really important it's work. It's the case here as well. Yeah, but at the same time, now there's many more Cambodians. Curating. So like the uh, Photo Phnom Pen, it's a French-led initiative. Christian Cajol is a curator, and he did the first many editions. By the fourth, fifth edition, I don't know what it is, 
is a Cambodian team of curators. And this came from, you know, how do you make a festival, training, how do you curate? So I think that's the goal, right? For, I mean, anybody that, yeah, it's difficult, but it's a great question. Yeah, I think what I really <coughs> liked uh, when Ellen spoke at the experimental hub last year was the way she was integrated into the community and uh, putting systems in place at a personal risk, if I may add that, because of the resistance there and also the non-governmental or the governmental non-support. Mm. And also not only non-support, but anti-movements, mm. uh, especially I think with the women mm. trying to do things there mm. and uh, how much resistance you had mm. and how she actually stood up for them for that art community, which actually helped give it a voice, mm. which is needed. Now, it doesn't matter whether you belong inside or outside. Mm. You just need a voice. And I think uh, what I felt was Erin was there to give it a voice, to give it a support, to give it uh, that platform. And look what's happened. It, you know, I would say she's more Cambodian than Cambodian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Cambodian, and she feels she understands their beliefs. She understands their community. She's uh, she's just part of them. You know, you just become the community. You become that mm. uh, that nation. And so it it's actually a, a like question Sonia of Nani. yeah. Yes. So who are you? <laughs> and uh, are you justified in doing the work that you are doing? And I would say for her, I just love the passion she had for the people. And she's actually moved herself out of it consciously mm -hmm. because she's had to face this question, mm -hmm. exactly the question that you asked. That you're non-Cambodian, but how come you're doing all this? Mm -hmm. And why that are you was just my question. But Maybe not part you. Of, I mean, part of it yeah. is there and it should be there. You know, yeah. it should be Which there. is valid in its own place, yes. but what I want to say is there's an honesty about her which I found uh, in her talk and even now in our interactions, it's so clear what she's doing, she's actually taking these artists and uh, doing what a curator is supposed to do. Show their works, yeah. talk about them, take them to you know important places and biennials and residencies where they can grow. Mm -hmm. And so she's actually building the art community of Cambodia. But externally, there's a lot. I think what's needed, if I can say, is education. And I don't mean that like, um, just imported education, um, you know, to be able to go to curatorial study school. It's not really that. I mean, I chose to go to so as a late age um, because, you know, the roots of culture are, are more there, you know, with art history than a curatorial studies program would allow. And it was through a grant called the Alpha Wood Scholarship. And that whole, the goal of the Alpha Wood is to bring, there's a lot of, a lot of young people from Cambodia, more than Myanmar allows. Um, to be able to make sure that Cambodians are the art historians. Mm -hmm. So if we look at all oh, this, it's all French. You know, so it's so French, the, of course, the colonial foundations of what <coughs> is archaeology, what is art, what is art history. I mean, that is a, a very incredible construction that the French made to isolate a couple of centuries of the highest uh, forms and make this Khmer perpetuate that in the making of more Khmer art. But, you know, Cambodia was well before. There's a prehistory. There's a prehistory to the 12th century, um, you know, and then there's history after that. And so, you know, my mentors are really looking at the Dark Ages, you know, and trying to say, of course, Cambodians need to, being able to be the epigraphists and the Sanskritists and the translators and the, um, yeah, and in every part of our work, I mean, my team was all, and the co-founders are Cambodian. And uh, one of them went away to get his master's in art history. Um, and that's really what it takes. It's just more and more. And in, unfortunately, I have to say, go away. It doesn't mean go far. I mean, even Malaysia, Singapore, but a lot go to New York or London or something. But it really changes everything, you know, when they come back um, to be a leader. And there just needs to be more and more scholarships, yeah, for that. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, I really thank you so much for your detailed and like comprehensive talk, and I really enjoyed it. So my question is, uh, I mean, how can you put some light on the relationship between art, society, and nature? 
and NATO. Yes, and and the impact of each other on all these. I mean, in between all these three. And what's the second one? Uh, impact of art on society or societies on art and mm -hmm. all these three. Okay. Like this. Um, I can speak, say from our work of like say a decade, um, you know, our community, if we say uh, what is a contemporary art's impact on society, sure. it stays very tight to the artists, their friends and their families. Okay. So our network, and then of course, um, you know, expats or sometimes tourists. But the network, I said, of course it grows, it's grown. But what is its place in society? There is no national collection. There is no um, private collection that is public. I mean, and collections do mean something. It's not just about you know acquisition in the market at all. It's really about who is there to care, to keep, and to maintain. It's not there. Um, so if we say, is contemporary art important for society? Mm, it might be in the new, you know, most of the newspapers were just closed two years ago. 15, 15 news outlets were closed. So now there's like, was there even any writing about it? Nobody who's writing. Does it disappear? You know, does a tree fall in the forest? Does it make any sound? You have an exhibition, does it, it makes no trace in words. And does, does it exist? It's also why documentation was so important to us. So I think it matters because we just, we think micro. Just make it matter to your community, you know, of artists, of family, of friends. Just make it matter there. And then we do programs like in our neighborhood. So uh, the pagoda across the street, we had an ongoing program with those kids. With universities, um, I used to teach, so I have ongoing programs. They come for the programs. And we just know that those kids will be leaders one day. And, um, you know, unfortunately, we ended up having to work, I mean, it's fine, but with the privileged schools, because the government schools were not helpful with, like, the bus or the van to get them there. It's not normal to go to a gallery. It's not valuable. Um, so I wouldn't say it has, like, a status, you know, but it will, yeah. But it's very enriching to those that live it, yeah. In terms of nature, it's a great question because a lot of the work um, is about change. So for the last decade, you know, the landscape has completely changed. It is deforested, it is polluted, there is fencing, it is urbanized. Um, a coastal community is unrecognizable. It's a forest that I used, I did a GPS project for a very dense forest. It's not there anymore. So the devastation of the environment and the change in urban living. When I moved to the city, there were dirt roads and no streetlights. <laughs> now it looks like Bangkok. I mean, a micro Bangkok, but. So, so much work is really about that. And in fact, I, I have kind of avoided a lot of that work. There are, yeah, another load of like, you know, five or 10 artists who really, really <coughs> follow change. Um, and it's a very documentary practice, um, and it doesn't necessarily, it documents yeah, a lot of urban change, because the artists are there in the urban environment. They also go out, one particular artist, Kwai um, is is going to different lands, um, he was in Documenta, uh, to look at, um, yeah, how maybe indigenous lands are threatened, um, indigenous forests are threatened. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a topic, and of course, there's a, a number of women who are um, like Malin, you see it like the, the cut forest. Um, other women are drawing very intricate flowers um, to honor their garden, their little garden in their house. But um, yeah, and then there's a lot of workshops. So there's less and less NGOs now because of the just current shift in the relationship between Cambodia and the US and its closeness to China. A lot of people had to leave, and so there's a lot less kind of funding. But if you get you know, a German cooperation program, yeah, it'll be about the environment. Or 
it, it's, it's kind of dictated to them, and I have to say a lot of artists start that way. It's like given a topic, and you have to make something for that topic because it's sponsored by, you know. So, but some, then this topic might work for them, and they continue, you know. Does that help to answer that question, or not really? Somewhat. Huh? Somewhat. Somewhat. <laughs> You mean, did you mean nature, like the natural yeah, environment? Nature, the, the like the natural, like the environment? Na yes, in <coughs> Yeah, we'd and say... And how does it impact to the art, and art impacts the nature? How does uh, nature impact art? We and can society, take this up later. Yeah, we can take I w I would, let's have a conversation, because <coughs> yeah. I think I need an example from you. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, thank you, Erin, yeah, and thank you for the audience, for the audience for patiently listening to all of us. We uh, enjoyed. Thank you. Please do come and see the exhibition yes. at yes. our Yes. It's also tomorrow. Oh. And yes. flowers. Oh. Thank you for coming. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you, Erin, for coming. So we'll see you tomorrow.